Well, it was a pleasure to see you some time ago in Puebla, City of Ideas, now here at the commemoration of the victims of the Holocaust. What is important to be here with many schools, non-Jewish schools, to have you here? It's really important to be here because 75 years after the Holocaust ended, its lessons remain extremely important. We are living in a world where there is still hatred, there is violence, there is anti-Semitism, there is genocide, and we need to have these lessons ingrained um, in the minds of our young people so that they can take action in a meaningful way. Tell me something. Today we have many non-Jewish schools here, and Jewish schools, and ambassadors, and many people that are not involved in Holocaust. To see a uh, survivor that maybe it's not alive or it's alive, but to see it in the way you are doing it. What do you want to them to learn about it or to know about it? What I want them to learn is that when we think about the Holocaust, um, very often we go straight to the images of the concentration camps and the terrible uh, scenes of destruction and hunger and starvation and all the corpses. But in fact, the, the history is still living. Holocaust survivors are still a part of our community. They are still telling their stories, and they are thinking about how do we tell this story in future? What I want the young people to realize is that this story needs to be told for all time, and the technology that we're using is not for the sake of technology. It's to say, how can we make sure that young people in the future that will not have the opportunity to talk directly with Holocaust survivors will still be able to engage with their videos and ask the questions that are on their minds. What's the difference between your technology and seeing a movie about a survivor or a testimony with what you are doing in the Shoah Foundation with these survivors? Well, usually when you interview somebody, um, you sit down and you ask a series of questions, yes. and one question follows another, follows another, and then you edit it and you make a documentary, maybe. Yes. In this case, what we do, we ask the Holocaust survivor maybe 500 or 1,000 questions, and all of those questions go into a database. Then when I come to talk to the survivor, I'm asking the video questions that are on my mind. Um, do you believe in God? What happened to your parents? How many camps were you in? Questions that I want to know the answer to, and the video will answer those questions from the database. After having 500 questions to each survivor from all around the world, you have many questions, many answers. But tell me one that has surprised you more. Well, I think one um, answer that really surprised me was um, I was talking with one Holocaust survivor and I asked him nearly 1,500 questions. And then when I asked him, what was the worst moment? And he gave me an interesting story. It was right towards the end of the Holocaust and he was in a barn and there was a young man who was actually like a mascot um, to the SS. He was a favorite of the SS. But he, when the morning came and they were going to go on the next stage of the march, he was nowhere to be seen. The young boy had fallen asleep. He was still asleep. When he, they found him and woke him up, the SS man took him and shot him. That wasn't the worst moment. Right. What the worst moment was that as soon as the young man had been shot, the other people, the other victims, ran to take his boots off his feet. Well, while he was still twitching. And he said to me, I didn't realize how sadistic the SS were until that moment that they would kill one of their favorites. And I also didn't realize how desperate we really were that the first thing in people's minds was, I need those boots. These stories are amazing, like many others you have there. How can people interact with these survivors? They have to be in the Shoah Center, they can be in, on the internet, they, they, there is an app, because it's important for next generations to have them. Right now, these interviews are available in a number of museums, yes. like for example, in Skokie, in Illinois, and in New York, and in Los Angeles. However, uh, we've just done one interview in Spanish, right. and we're gonna do another one very soon with uh, uh, Julio Botón and Dolly yes. Botón, who live here in Mexico City. And hopefully soon, they'll be available, for example, in a museum like Museo Memorial Tolerancia, or, um, if you wait for another maybe year or two, you'll be able to get them on your internet at home. Do you know that the new anti-Semitism, they say it's the denying of the Holocaust. 
just these days, it was the, the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the, the liberation of Auschwitz, and it was a big event in Israel with the biggest heads, let's say, of the, of the war there. It's important how to, den it's important this movement about denying the Holocaust and how to respond to them, because in some years, uh, they will be like a, a history, like we remember, I don't know, so many things. I think it's really important that Yad Vashem did this gathering of world leaders. I think it's extremely important that um, world leaders are gathering at the Auschwitz site to commemorate also. However, commemorating is not enough. We have to turn our remembrance into action. And I would ask the world leaders, say, say to the world leaders, thank you for being there, but please, when you get back to your countries, act on what you set. Because we cannot have hatred and intolerance in our world, and we are looking for you to make decisions and have leadership that puts this to an end. Thank you, thank you for being here at the Sim Ort, at the Yiddish Shul, and thank you for being in Mexico, and thank you for doing these interviews in, Mex in Spanish for everybody that speaks Spanish. Thank you. <laughs>